Hey, everybody, we have something to celebrate, and I hope that you'll do it with me. This is the 100th episode of the Today Count Show. Our guest today is Dr. Justin Irving, and we will be talking about organizational leadership. We'll be talking about leading at the highest level, and I hope that you enjoy it. But let me explain this celebration. I could be labeled sometimes as an achiever, sometimes driven, sometimes type A. And though I don't agree with all of those ideas that that describe those, those three words or three phrases, one thing that I am consistently poor at is celebrating achievements. I tend to be one of those guys that gets something done and then I just move on to the next stage without taking the time to sit back and to celebrate what has been accomplished. If you know anything about podcasts, you know that having 100 episodes is an achievement. So I want to notice that, honor that. I also want to thank my three key team members to this date. I want to give a shout out to Mike, to Michelle, and to Rhonda. Thank you so much, the three of you, for helping me do what we do. And how can I say thank you without saying thank you to all of our donors who support this show? I make a promise to you, we continue to go on with even more fervor than we have before. We're going to get deeper, we're going to get better, and we're going to continue to make the Today Count show something that makes a difference in many, many people's life. So with that, let's welcome Dr. Justin Irving. Welcome to the Today Counts show. Today does count because it impacts, it influences your tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. The Today Counts podcast is sponsored by the generous donors of the Lead Today community. I'm your host, Kim Piper. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Today Counts show. I am really excited about today's conversation. I have as my guest, Dr. Justin Irving, uh, Justin probably wouldn't know this, but I've always kind of viewed him as a distant friend. And I took a distance course from him many, many years ago uh, in leadership. And I don't remember if that was for the D-Men program or MDiv program. I don't remember which. But I do remember that the concepts that uh, he shared with me, particularly the visual concepts, and I've got a journal uh, that's over my left shoulder sitting in my bookshelf that I honestly pulled down at least monthly because I took the slides that he shared and I reproduced them with my hand in my, in my journal. And it's anything from managing change, understanding the change, a bell shaped curve, you know, and uh, all kinds of triangle ideas. And I have used them for the last, it's been at least 20 years. It's probably, probably longer than that. Uh, Dr. Justin Irving is a professor of Christian leadership. Um, one of the other books I have, I think it's on my over my right shoulder, is entitled Leadership in Christian Perspective, which I purchased and read and highlighted and use in my own work as a, uh, a pastor, a leadership coach, um, a friend, and frankly, in my own life. Uh, just try, try to keep my head on straight. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of my leadership conversations with men and women around the country, we're doing just that, aren't we? We're just trying to keep our head on straight. We're trying to lead right. We're not perfect. Leadership is hard. However, Dr. Irving has just written another book entitled Healthy Leadership for Thriving Organizations. This man is a, I would call him insightful, humble. I would also call him down to earth. And if you are a leader and you need a mentor in your life, and it's and even if it has to be distant, I would encourage you to pick up these books and become studious, work on your leadership, not just in your leadership. So, Dr. Irving, Justin, uh, thank you so much for joining us today on the Today Count Show. Well, thanks for having me, Jim. It's just a real joy to continue our rich conversations over the years and uh, to talk a little bit about this new project. Yeah, before we we hit the record button, you and I started chattering. I was looking at the clock, and I said, "Oh my gosh, we better we better get going here because uh, you have 
uh, imp- important things to do. And, and I've got a lunch appointment that I, <laughs> I have to, I have to get to. Uh, uh, talk to me about this book, uh, a little bit, Healthy Leadership for Thriving Organizations. Um, what, what brought you to, to write that? Was it, uh, some academic uh, assignments that you needed to, to lay out in the classroom? I mean, I know that you're not just a professor. I also see that you, you, you're beginning to take on leadership roles in the academia, academia, uh, realm. So just, just tell me a little bit, what, what was the origin of, uh, the reason why? Well, uh, in some ways, even just uh, your introduction kind of prompted some of these thoughts for me. You, you've been tracking with me on some of the themes that I write about in this book for a couple decades now because uh, it relates to some of that work of what I initially uh, had kind of um, engaged around what I call the leadership communication pyramid and uh, working through change conversations, conflict conversations, organizational culture conversations, how who we are as leaders, it, as persons who are leading, need to bring that into those spaces. And all of those I would situate in organizational level leadership. Uh, now, of course, change and conflict and, and culture, uh, those are things that relate to us individually in one-on-one um, conversations of leadership, but they really matter for those who have to lead at what we might call that 30,000 foot level. Uh, they, they're thinking about teams of people. They're thinking about divisions of organizations or they're thinking about whole churches or organizations or nonprofits uh, or beyond, right? There's a, there's a sense of which they have to think about the stewardship responsibility of the whole. So I've been writing about leadership for a, a long time. And uh, this project was motivated by trying to 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 think about the challenges and needs of leaders who have those uh, sort of bigger picture responsibilities. And so uh, I, I've been thinking about this in coursework for a long time, but this led me to engage in a, in a new research project where I uh, surveyed um, around 216 uh, executive level leaders. So talking about you know, CEOs, presidents, vice presidents, lead pastors and churches, provosts, deans, these kinds of people who are who are either over an organization uh, and thinking about the stewardship responsibility of that whole organization or uh, those who are thinking about large teams and divisions. And uh, it was just really a joy to interact with those voices, some of the insights that they shared, bring that into conversation with the, the broader leadership literature and um, hopefully share something that was uh, a valuable resource uh, to those who are in similar roles or are aspiring to those kinds of leadership responsibilities. I, you know, I was kind of guessing wh- why I have always been attracted to your, your approach. And, uh, you know, when, when I, when I just kind of took a harder look at your, your background uh, from an academic perspective, it, 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 it makes sense to me now. I mean, you have education in psychology, obviously you have education in uh, biblical lit- literature, but also an MBA and your PhD in organizational uh, structure, all of these things going on in, in your head um, is, you know, probably is, well, you know, God made you that way. And, you know, you start moving in, in that direction and, and now you've, You've got these concepts that have become very helpful, you know, to to many people. Um, the first word that I picked up on is the word that you used is stewardship, and I I heard that the other day. Also, I think it was with Gary Herbst, uh, who who is I believe on the East Coast and uh, is working on a leadership platform for Christian leaders uh, who want to take that holistic. Uh, approach. And I, I think it was he who was kept using that term mm-hmm. stewardship. Mm-hmm. And, you know, unless you're in a, a, a church environment where you're learning about financial stewardship, you don't hear that word a lot anymore, but I'm beginning to hear it more often now when it comes to this responsibility yeah. uh, of, of leadership. So I picked up I picked up on that. I've got a question I you know that I want to ask mm-hmm. you here in a second. But as soon as you you did that, I jumped every everywhere from a entrepreneur 
to uh, some of my clients that work in Fortune 500 publicly traded companies mm -hmm. where the org chart is not that simple. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's not just, it's not, it's complicated, it's complex. In fact, at some point, I even wonder how good organizational charts work mm -hmm. um, when, an, when an organization gets to a certain size. And so I start replacing organizational charts in my head to words like culture mm -hmm. and organizational savvy um, and those kinds of things, which are <laughs> more abstract than a concrete organizational chart. Yet the organizational chart just simply doesn't answer a lot of the questions that get asked in real time in large organizations. Um, when, when, when you break up your book and, you know, let's just look at the title, mm -hmm. Healthy Leadership, Healthy Leadership, Thriving Organizations. I'm assuming that that's almost like an equation. Healthy leadership equals thriving organizations. Is that too far of a reach or, or what, what is your, you know, what is your, your, your basic message throughout the book? If I could, I know that's a, I don't think that's a layup question. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, of course, uh, a significant uh, part of what I'm trying to argue in the book. And so I've already kind of noted that the target of the book is thinking about those organizational level leaders and the responsibilities that uh, folks have at that big picture level. But what I'm arguing uh, is there really is, and, and, and this is something that I think uh, Christians especially uh, would find resonance with, but I, but I would argue that those even coming from a, a perspective outside the Christian worldview would, would want to create context where people can be flourishing, right? That they can be thriving in their lives as human beings. And I think there's a whole theology that we can talk about around human flourishing that comes from a, a biblical perspective. But I also think it's a human story, right? People uh, being able to lean into who they are meant to be. And I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, organizations, workplaces, ministry contexts. So as we think about organizations and churches, these places play a significant and important role in the degree to which people are flourishing in life or are experiencing hardship in life. Uh, and uh, it's one thing just to observe like, oh, there's a healthy organization or there's an unhealthy organization. But what I want to kind of lean into is there are some people for whom they don't just have to look at that and sort of accept those realities. I think leaders are in places and positions where they can do something about it, right? They can become healthy people that are working with and developing healthy people in their organizations that are going to then create organizations that have a general spirit of health, thriving financially and from human perspectives that create contexts where people can flourish. So for me, an organization that is thriving and a leader that is healthy is positioned to have a ripple effect of health on others that are connected to those organizations and places. So uh, in the early two chapters of the book, that's where a lot of that stewardship and flourishing language is uh, setting the stage for the conversation. And I think for those that kind of want to jump in and say, what's the change strategy? They'll get there. They got to read towards the, the end of the book for some of the strategy kinds of things. But I'm, I lay the foundation in the first two chapters for but why does it matter that we get these things right? And that's where the hmm. language of health and stewardship and thriving comes in for me. And that is why it matters. Is that what I'm hearing? Is, is for, for people to thrive, they were made on purpose for a purpose, those kinds of things that, that we say. Yeah, and for most of us, we find the significance in our work and the meaning of our work in relationship with other in organizations, right? We're not tending to work in isolation. We are in networks of relationships. Those are organizations for the most part. We want to lean into that as a context for pursuing excellence in our work from a business perspective, a nonprofit perspective, educational perspective, where we're creating contexts that are healthy where people can be flourishing and thriving in their engagement there. That's good. If we were to engage in a conversation about what a healthy leader looks like, a healthy, uh, yeah, I guess we need to tag it that because that's the context of our conversation. Uh, what does a healthy leader 
look like? What, what are some of the attributes of a healthy leader? Well, there's a number of things we could lean into. Um, I think themes around character and competency matter. I think th themes around their um, convictions and their capacity matter. I think themes around uh, the chemistry that they nurture in relationship with others, the culture that they um, nurture in an organizational context matters. And, uh, and then looking to how we um, engage in healthy complement with other people. So I, I threw out a lot of C words there that I kind of walked through in one of the chapters, but it really comes yeah, down missed, to. Yeah, I missed one of them. I got character, competency, convictions, uh, chemistry, culture. Yeah, I'd said uh, so, uh, capacity and context oh, and yeah, complement as well as a okay. few key words there. But it really starts with who we are as people because we bring who we are as people into relationship with other people and into the workplace context of organizational life. And so if we have people of character, I think it's not just something that makes us sort of uh, feel good about ourselves. I, I think character matters for the relationships and work that we do as well. For example, I think character infuses leaders with a spirit of courage and conviction. It's hard to lead with courage and conviction in the absence of character. Another thing it provides, right, is, is a context in, within which people can have trusting working relationships. And as we well know, right, trust is something that takes a sort of a lifetime to build in relationship with others, but it takes moments uh, to lose that trust in relationship with others. So character provides trust in our relationships. Uh, it also, I would argue, has a bottom line effect. Uh, so there's an interesting book that comes out from uh, HBR from uh, Kyle, a K-I-E-L is the last name of the author, that kind of walks through uh, the importance of uh, virtuous or character-driven leaders. And in that study, he found that uh, virtuous leaders tended to perform at least five times better in terms of bottom line results in their CEO positions for organizations. So in other words, we can talk about the, the sort of moral convictions for why character matters in leaders, but I think there's a business case for it as well that businesses do better when they're led by uh, leaders who are building um, courage and conviction and trust and humility in light of this foundation of character in their lives. You use the term building and, and so that implies intentional work. And that's kind of the issue, is it not? Is that we, we get so busy, you know, working. There's so much labor to do. There's so many challenges and expectations that for, for many well-intentioned leaders, it's, they're, they're, you know, to be critical, not critical like negatives, mm -hmm. but to, to, pull it apart in an engineering to reverse engineer it. We're just not spending enough time working on our lives, working on um, our hearts, working on our, our why, learn, you know, working on why am I doing this? What's the purpose of this? Um, uh, that intentionality, you know, and, and uh, you know, before we, we hit the record button, you know, I, I had mentioned, Covey's work, you know, in, in the 1980s. And, and I was in my late 20s when I started reading that. And it, it's amazing. Let's see if I can say this in a, in a constructive way. It, it, it's amazing how ignorant I was about the, uh, that it, it took intentionality to grow you know, as, as a person, it's not automatic. Mm -hmm. It's, and, and the reason why I'd say that is because when I would read a paragraph from Stephen Covey, it would just like wake up a whole new room in my head uh, of things I'd never thought about. And, and even, you know, even the ability to use the God given imagination to step outside of myself and to walk around myself and to, and to uh, wonder why I feel threat in this way or that way, or, or why I sometimes lead out of preference instead of purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and when I, when I, I think that was probably one of the biggest ahas when I became more intentional about growing from a leader, how much I led out of preference. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. You know, simply personality, what I'm good at, what I like doing. And, you know, those things by themselves, to me, you know, are not evil or wrong, but they're often not what's needed mm-hmm. in a context, if, if, if that makes, if that makes sense. So this whole idea of all these C's, you know, that, that you've, you've given it just to me, you know, I think of a person of conviction and, you know, what, what does that mean? And, and some folks, because they haven't really worked on defining those convictions, articulating those convictions. And in this day and age, might might I even say, write down those convictions, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe a hundred years ago or 200 years ago or 500 years ago, you know, we maybe didn't think in those, in the, in those ways, unless we were a poet, Mm -hmm. you know, or, or some, something like that. But in this day and age, especially how fast it moves with technology I, I sometimes, uh, you know, challenge leaders. When's the last time you actually, I mean, even push the laptop away and there's nothing against pulling up Google docs and, you know, starting your written work that way. But I often say, you know, the problem with that darn laptop is it talks to you mm-hmm. and it interrupts you. It's, it's a, it's not just a person, it's a choir of people. Yeah. And maybe it's time to back away and grab a good old fashioned pencil and journal you know, and start writing some, but you know, what are we doing as leaders intentionally, you know, to grow? How much time do we give ourselves, you know, to grow? Can you, can, can you, and this has always been frustrating for me because to me, it's a capacity issue, especially when it comes to um, ha- having multiple relationships that are highly intense in nature is if I spend X amount of time per day working on me, how does that radiate Mm -hmm. beyond me? How long does it last? Is it, if, if I spend an hour a week working on me, is that sufficient to take on a 60 hour week Mm -hmm. working with everybody else? Kind of comes just like back to math and, Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I'm on a little rant here, but I I think that, I, I think that, you know, I asked you the question, so what is, what does a healthy leader look like? And you threw out all these C's that are, that's in your book. And I'm thinking, well, man, the only way I can do that is take a look at how much time am I even investing in me? I'm not talking about crashing on the couch with a remote trying to recover. That's not the working on me that, that, that I'm talking about. Um, It just, it just seems to me that because there's so much weight on a leader, how much time are they spending in the gym so that they can, you know, the, the, I'm talking about the mental, the spiritual, and yes, the physical gym so that when the weight is thrown on them, they've got the muscle Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to, to deal with it. But instead what happens is, you know, the story of my life, you know, I was a young athlete and then, you know, I got my desk job, white collar guy, and I'd go out on the weekends and play as if I was still training, yeah. you know, Monday through Friday, and I'd get hurt. Mm-hmm. In fact, every single one of my serious physical sports injuries has come from recreational stuff, not organized stuff. Mm-hmm. And isn't that a good picture of kind of where leaders find themselves sometimes? I, I I think it is, and uh, just to sort of affirm with you on this this priority of, of self leadership, we might call it. Uh, I would I would clarify, and I think you'd agree with this that that self leadership is not saying that the leader is more important to care for than members of the organization, but I would say there is a sequential priority, right? That if we don't do this self leadership work well in a leadership context, uh, there's not the capacity to be able to uh, have an other-centered orientation in building the needs of the organization in a healthy way. And so uh, thinking through lots of categories, spiritual health, uh, emotional health, physical health, intellectual health, and uh, health, and just practical kinds of issues. So I, one of the things I did in this, the survey with these 216 executive leaders was just asking them, what are some of the major issues or challenges that you face? 
And uh, self-leadership was one of the the dominant responses. So uh, there's kind of five big categories that I could kind of walk you through some of those. But uh, number two in the areas of concern followed uh, flowed around this theme of self-leadership. And so the, the priority to be able to make sure we're being the kind of healthy leaders we need to be for the purpose of serving others well. And if we're not doing that self-leadership work, we really are eating away at our capacity to serve others well in leadership responsibilities. Yeah. So it's not like we're, it's not like we're, 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 uh, you know, spanking, you know, leaders. We're more, it's more of an exhortation, right? I mean, it's an affirmation and then an exhortation. The affirmation is thank you for leading. Thank you for, you know, being willing to take on more responsibility. Thank you for that. And we know, we believe your intentions are, are good and we're with you. I'm with you for sure. That's my calling is to serve leaders. And the exhortation, future-based, today and future-based is, but man, you know, you're going to end up in the ER yeah. if yeah. if you don't take care of your leader, your personhood, so that there is not just stuff left, but, and I know this is going to sound idealistic, but, you know, I do a lot of speaking. But one thing I learned, I don't know, probably uh, 10 years into the the weekly preaching is that it was really easy to go from being a man who was in study and let the overflow of study get into a, a word or a message versus preparing for a message. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In other words, I went from a student who was learning how to communicate what I was learning and what I thought was important to the audience to somebody who became a professional communicator and worked on the constructs of presentation, but now slowly but surely leaning on what I already knew, but it was no longer alive. Mm -hmm. It was, it was stale. So what I've learned today, and, and I know this might be very intimidating for many leaders and now and maybe Justin, maybe this is just how I'm wired. I'm, I'm not hundred percent sure, but I do not know how to leave the house without first taking in information whether that is reading my Bible, whether that is reading a, a leadership book, frankly, history, it almost doesn't matter. It's like, how am I feeding myself? Mm -hmm. And then it's interesting to me how often it is useful, regardless of what I'm reading, even if I decided to go back and, and brush up my math because I don't use it very much. And now I know I'm really flabby at math mm -hmm. and I think, okay, let me go to the library and get one of those. I don't know. I probably have to start at the sixth grade level, mm -hmm. <laughs> get the math book out. But when I re-energize that, it just does, it's powerful. It does something mm -hmm. for me. And, and, you know, for, for those that are listening uh, for you, hundred percent for you. And I, I have been on the other side of this. I, I have become a professional at what I was doing and out of the urgencies of the day and the, the least amount of hours in the week, um, I kind of rely on my skill sets. Let's call it, let's pull out one of these C's, lean more on my competencies, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but your competencies will dry up if they're not fueled mm -hmm. by substance, right? Substance. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, what, right. one, one thing I'd add to that is, uh, so you, you certainly have highlighted how um, lack of attention to self-leadership uh, could just personally harm us, right? We could end up in a hospital, yeah. uh, kind of not caring for ourselves in a burned out situation. Um, you've also talked about how uh, the, 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 the communication that comes out of us can end up being a little bit more dry and stale rather than sort of impassioned and fresh, which I agree with. I, similar to that, I would also say from a leadership per perspective in particular, so we're, we're talking about those who have um, wide responsibilities of organizations, large divisions, teams, 
what's needed is not just always reactive and mere tactical kind of uh, work. We mm, need deep right. thinking. We need strategic thinking. And I would say, and this is something that came through from the surveyed executive leaders, was just how challenging it is, but how important it is to fight for time to do deep thinking and strategic thinking. In other words, often the, the, the solutions that we need to find in this world where we're facing challenges we've never faced before, where it's not just change leadership, but also crisis leadership, we need to have some really deep roots that are uh, uh, permeating uh, our lives and going deep out of our lives. And that means there's time and space to build those things, like you're saying, to be reading, taking in, listening to things but also just time and space to do that deep work, the mm. deep thinking, the strategic thinking. And that's, that's a self-leadership issue to carve out that space in our lives from a time management perspective. I, I feel that still in my life, even though I'm in my 60s now, um, uh, I mean, I, all kinds of things, right? I, I, I've learned that I don't always have to be talking in a meeting, for example, um, um, you know, I'm just at a different place in life, but I still notice that what is similar leading in my sixties and when I was leading in my twenties is I still have to protest when the walls start coming in. Mm -hmm. I have to say, you know what, uh, somehow, some way I have let the boundaries come down. Um, I have, I'm saying yes to things. I shouldn't be saying yes to things. And it might sound like it's a, it's a self-preservation thing. And, a, and I guess in a sense it is, but to your point, it, it's, again, it's really about building my capacity so that I can continue to serve, not just today, but I can have longevity in, 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 in my service. And it's almost like, you know, you just got to say, whoa, okay, I got, I just got to intentionally push everything away. And then the scary thing about what you're sharing, uh, Justin, is that it's like, you know, Rhonda and I, my wife and I, we, we used to have a habit of going to Hawaii every other year. And uh, I, I noticed that when I would go to Hawaii, um, you know, there's really, uh, at least where we would go, um, we, we like to go to the more secluded, you know, areas versus the high traffic areas. Mm -hmm. I noticed something about my, my soul mm -hmm. is that even though I had some built in things that I thought, you know, were taking care of me. It would take me like three days being in Hawaii to go to finally go, you know what? I'm in Hawaii <laughs> and I, I need to let go of the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah. And that to me was testimony that even if we think we are doing well, we might be surprised how much we're still running on adrenaline. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would literally take, you know, almost the better part of a half a week yeah. to give myself permission to say, I can actually sit here and think about nothing. Yeah. And, and that gets me in the place where then all of a sudden I start thinking really clearly mm -hmm. about things mm -hmm. and going, wow. And you come back, you know, as we say that, Hey, I'm curious uh, you mentioned that, you know, in your in your work with these 216 executives, these leaders, that that they gave you a list of, of their challenges and the first being self-leadership. Would you mind sharing some of the other uh, insights? And yeah. Yeah. And just for for those that are kind of have curiosity about some of the the under the hood work here, uh, you know, I ended up having about 600 over 600 kind of coded occurrences where essentially going through their feedback and saying, that's an important insight. That's an important insight. So, you know, 600 times and these 600 uh, coded occurrences, they grouped around uh, five macro areas. Uh, there were a few other uh, minor themes that emerged as well, but the macro areas were uh, the importance of knowing how to work with people. And that shouldn't surprise us. Leadership is about people. But uh, almost a third of those uh, 600 occurrences grouped around uh, things related to staff and volunteers. So how do you how do you recruit the right people? How do you how do you get talent on your team? How do you train them and equip them and uh, deploy them well? How do you empower people? How do you motivate them so that they're being retained in effective ways? So just the how do we how do we work with the people of our communities? It might seem like a, a simple thing, but it was a dominant consideration on the minds of these executive leaders. Um, and it, lots of interesting observations and conversations about that in the book. 
The second theme that we've just been talking about is self-leadership. And that was about a hundred of those coded occurrences landed in that self-leadership area. And uh, again, I don't think it's a surprise for those of us who who see these points of a connection. It's hard to practice sometimes, like your Hawaii example uh, illustrated. Right. But um, I think we see the importance when we're not doing that work of self-leadership as a sequential priority, it, uh, it takes away from our capacity to, to lead others well. Uh, the third area that uh, was, uh, you know, at a, at a similar level was the importance of thinking about the, the stewardship of the mission and vision of the organization. So we can think about themes like mission drift and how easy it is over time to just have the urgency of now and the, the demands and fires that are coming up in court, uh, organizations to begin to kind of erode the priority. And well, somebody who's sort of working in a uh, in a corner of an organization and they just sort of need to think about their own work, they can be kind of myopic and focused in that way. But but organizational leaders, they're the ones that need to make sure, along with the boards that they work with typically, need to make sure that they're staying focused, that the mission and vision are before them in their own work regularly, but also uh, are before the organization as people think about aligning their particular teams and jobs with that core vision and mission. Uh, the fourth element that was uh, a major concern for people was just the changing landscape. Now, for some context, I did this study uh, in 2022. So, you know, we're still coming out of all the challenges associated with the pandemic and, uh, you know, how people approach that, the impact on human resources in the organizations that people were leading, the challenge of, of hiring people as, uh, as people were, you know, uh, just, just dealing with lots of human resource uh, talent acquisition kinds of challenges. And so the changing landscape uh, was something on the mind of leaders. And that was across sectors, you know, just the, how the changing landscape was affecting things. And then the fifth one was uh, the importance of financial margin. You know, how do we make sure that we are attending to an effective margin in our organization so that we can stay focused on the mission of the organization? And, uh, you know, the mission sounds more energizing. Uh, and uh, sometimes having to think about the finances of operations uh, is just uh, is a reality that feels like more works. But if we don't get margin right, and that's true for for-profit and nonprofit organizations, if we don't get margin yeah. right, we don't have a sustainable mission that we can engage. So uh, dominant voice among these leaders as well about the importance of thinking uh, of those areas. So those were the, the top five kinds of themes, along with some other sub themes that emerged along the way. Those are challenging, <clears throat> each, you know, each and every one of them. Uh, earlier on, you know, you, you, you mentioned almost in the, in the same breath um, about the, the, the stewardship of, of being a healthy leader. So that if you will, yeah. uh, you can create that opportunity uh, for the people that they lead. Can you talk a little bit about maybe what, what do those activities look like? What does that strategy look like creating that culture where people uh, uh, can be who they're meant to be, uh, who are thriving? Um, what, what does that look like? And then if I could throw in that curveball of, is it really that different from generation to generation mm -hmm. or do though, if I can call them nuances, I don't know if I'm allowed to do that or not, but if, if I were to call them nuances, um, do, do they change any of those strategies mm. or, or are these strategies, you know, bigger than the generational uh, differences that, that we experience? Yeah, it, it, maybe we could just dive right into that kind of generational conversation. Uh, I do know that it, and for some some of these leaders in the survey kind of highlighted the fact that they're they're in organizational contexts where, in practice, they're 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 working with people in their context that span at least four different sort of generational groups, and along with right. that, of course, are nuances of how people work and how people thrive. I just was in a, uh, had a doctoral seminar earlier in January and uh, one of the, the individuals in the class who's a manager in a business context, he, he, he just observed uh, how people are encouraged in different generations. And these are of course stereotypes, Dif different people fall, can have different experiences themselves. But he said, you know, there's something about like a, 
uh, a generation of folks that maybe are in our kind of ranges, the you know the the fifties and sixties, where like if you give an, if you give them a hey job well done every six months, you're probably good to go as a as a as a boss. Like okay great, you let me know I'm on the right track, and I'll keep doing what I'm doing the next six months. Uh, or so sometimes that's it's affirmation. Even, what's that? Yeah. A- so affirmation once every six months. Yeah. So, but the the younger generations, uh, just experience. This is just sort of experiential insights from a manager. Was uh, some of these new workforce people? You know, th- so think about your eighteen to twenty five year olds. Almost need yeah. to hear daily, like you're on track. You're you're doing what I want you to do. Thanks, thanks for a job well done. And it's sort of you can almost see the progression across the generations of how that how that shifts. Now, to some of my own reach research on this, uh, I did a, a study with uh, Valerie Nordby, uh, looking at uh, how different styles of leadership worked, particularly in a. This was a a, a campus. Uh, organization that was being studied and how staff in those campus organizations working with younger people, a, a younger generation were motivated. And we looked at differences between like paternalistic leadership, uh, servant leadership, autocratic leadership, these kinds of differences. And across the board, uh, the more high touch relational dimensions of things like servant leadership just demonstrated uh, higher effectiveness with this population of that was work that were younger people and working with younger people. So I, I think that uh, you know the, the 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 typical just command and control autocratic styles. Maybe we could have gotten by with that in previous generations just due to the cultural ethos. I think with younger generations, more relational emphases more uh, proactive affirmation and encouragement, whether we like that or not, that tends to be really significant for younger populations. How do we understand these changes more than the, um, you know, the the generalities that we throw out, like it's one generation reacts to the previous generation, you know, uh, kind, kind of philosophy. Is there another way to understand you know, how we have gone from this more, you know, structured, you know, boomer uh, deal to the X or to the millennial, to the Gen Z. Um, and I, cause I haven't really studied that. Is, is there, is there a, a clear theory uh, other than, you know, what I threw out is, you know, a grenade, you know, one generation responds to the next and it just seems to be a sequence in that way. Yeah, so I wouldn't I wouldn't name this as like a a focused area of research for me, so I can't speak to kind of the the the, yeah. the best practice of what's in the field. Uh, I just know from kind of that one study I did and what I'm hearing from students of mine and organizations that there 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 practically are differences. And I would say at a minimum, that means that if a leader in their organization doesn't have all the, the theory that might be available out there, they at least need to be a sort of situational leader that's ready to understand where is the employee or volunteer at in my context? Do they need higher support and affirmation? Do they need lower support and affirmation? Just need me to delegate things to them? That's that's kind of the core of what situational leadership is. How do we move people who are lower competence to a higher level of competence in their work? And then how are we kind of giving variable levels of support as needed based upon the people that we're working with? So I'm just applying some situational leadership thinking yeah. to generational engagement. And I think that's at least one tool that we can be using in our uh, leadership toolbox. And and I would think that that could be found out by more than just observation, trial and error. Mm-hmm. It could it could be found out by open conversation uh, with with uh, what people like and dislike or or how they respond best. You know where where it's possible, uh, right? I mean, you know, I, I think I think kind of where the tension might be is is a, a rigid leader, if, you know, if we can just borrow that word, no one's going to want that term, you know, put upon them. But sometimes a rigid leader will push back on the individual needs, thinking that that individual is somehow now corrupting and manipulating the organization versus meeting the needs of the organization. Um, and then the the more gifted, naturally relational uh, leader 
might find themselves connecting really well with their team, but it's also possible that they might be viewed by others in the organization as somebody who isn't driving uh, uh, results. Not to say that relationship is the common thread here, um, but um, it, I mean, what are your thoughts uh, about that? Are, I mean, because I, I, what I'm, what, here's, here's what I'm digging at. You know, everybody has insecurity and mm -hmm. every leader struggles with insecurity. Some leaders are probably trying to guess what their, their uh, team members, their, their followers want and need and could be way off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so therefore it's almost like, you know, you're trying too hard to get that date, right? Mm -hmm. You're trying too hard to get that date. So you scare off that date. And that can be a weirdness. Do you have any insight into that or advice about that? Uh, well, mo mostly just an affirmation of kind of your line of question and the implications of that, that yes, I do think um, not assuming, uh, asking, um, engaging with people, seeing what how we can be uh, organizational leaders that are serving the needs of our people of ge different generations well. And so to be proactive and ask, and that's that's one of the the topics that uh, I engage in the communication area in this book and a little bit in the previous book as well, but that uh, the communication really needs to be two way. And there are some executive leaders that are not good at this. There are some executive leaders that get so isolated that they're really not hearing from the voices of their people, uh, whether that be through formal or informal pathways. And uh, Colin Powell was, uh, you know, he, he, he had a quote where he was referring to communication saying, the moment your soldiers have stopped communicating with you is the moment you've stopped leading them. And his point was, well, is like, they've either uh, stopped trusting you uh, or they think you have, you're incompetent in your work as a leader. And so uh, be, be, make sure that those lines of communication are open. And in this particular conversation, it's uh, keeping the lines of communication open with different generations to understand how we can provide differential uh, leadership needs to these different populations. I, my mind ran as you were kind of uh, pressing into this generation theme of uh, just potential new studies in my mind. Uh, one, of, one of the studies that I did with a... Um, it was a healthcare uh, organization. I had about 1,600 people participate in the study and uh, were, was looking at the degree to which um, the leader's sense of purpose was important to the effectiveness of the organization and also then looked at things like goal orientation and follower focused. Uh, but, I, but I had a thought like I could, I could probably go back to uh, some, of that, um, some of that research data and uh, look at it and break it down by age uh, of the follower to see if there's the, my, my suspicion is, and this is just from, from kind of lots of classroom conversations, my sp suspicion is younger generations, particularly those kind of in their 20s, the, the question of purpose really matters, right? I, I think there's, there's a sense of duty in some older generations where I'm just going to go out and do the job that needs to get done. I think purpose still matters for, for those generations. But I think right. for younger generations, a lot of times they're willing to have a lower paycheck if they believe in the work that they're doing and there's a sense of purpose mm. to it. And that might be another angle on this question that uh, the sense of purpose with which the leader is leading and helping the followers see the meaningfulness of the work that they're doing. I, my suspicion, hypothesis would be uh, that's probably even more important for those younger generations in the workforce. Yeah, I, I already referred to uh, the podcast I did a couple of weeks ago with Gary Herbst, and he had a phrase that I really uh, enjoyed. He said, "You know, uh, the power of what po what purpose really does, what what it really uh, provides, is it provides order in chaos." Mm. And I thought, man, that that that's really good. And he even went to the Genesis text, and and uh, he, he's an engineer by trade, and so. Yeah. You know, he they some kind sometimes point out things, uh, subtleties. Mm -hmm. You know, in in text that we uh, can miss. And and just remind everybody, we are talking about Dr. Justin Irving's book, Healthy Leadership for Thriving Organizations. In this work that that you did, is there anything that uh, anything one, two, or three that that you know uh, caught you by surprise or or uh, affirmed what you were kind of seeing and believing that just kind of stuck out. And then the second question I have is, you know, obviously the book is on leadership, but, but is there a particular target audience that, 
that uh, you think that this this book really speaks to? Mm, that's good. I know I ga- I know I gave you two questions <coughs> at once, but yeah. Um, so in terms of like, uh, I'll, I'll go with the second first. You know who it's for. Um, I do think it is helpful for any leader, and uh, I, broadly speaking, I think it's beneficial for people, but uh, it would be, I think, particularly important for those who either currently are overseeing multiple individuals in their work or uh, are aspiring to be a leader who is overseeing a large number of people. So, And uh, the people from the study, they, they were drawn from multiple sectors, uh, business, church, education, nonprofit. I think I had a couple uh, government kinds of oriented leaders in there, but that really was not a dominant theme. It was more business, church, education, nonprofit. And so anybody who's aspiring to lead in one of those sectors at a high level, uh, that is, that's kind of the target. for. Uh, that's who I wrote this book for. I think connected to that is like people who are working with those kinds of leaders. So board members who are working with executive leaders. Um, assistants who are working in the offices of these kinds of leaders, students of leadership as well, uh, are kind of those who fall into this category. And, uh, you know, in terms of some of the surprises, I would say uh, there were not a lot that were like radical surprises, but I would say the magnitude of some of the responses is what was the surprise. So, for instance, I, I came into this project with a conviction that self-leadership matters, but the amount of people that really double down and say, no, no, this is a top priority for us as leaders um, was significant. I mean, one person even used a pretty extreme number. I, I don't know if I would argue for this number, but uh, this was a CEO saying that, that he would argue that uh, really a, a leader needs to be spending about 50% of their time on self-leadership kinds of things. So whether we yeah. take that number uh, at face value or, or we just get the point that a significant amount of the leader's time needs to be focused on this deep thinking self-leadership work. So that kind of magnitude, uh, those were the elements of uh, surprises that were woven in there. I, I would affirm that, uh, you know, especially uh, having this survey go out in 2022, uh, just the, the significance of the disruption that had hit many organizations over the previous two years was uh, we really, it would be difficult to overstate how much that was on the minds of people. So the changing landscape and the changing dynamics in their employee workforces or volunteer workforces uh, was significant. And so uh, finding the right people, uh, in terms of recruitment and identification and retaining the right people when people were in this season of quiet quitting and all these other dynamics, those issues were really on the forefront of people's minds uh, from the executive perspective. Outstanding. I have not ordered my copy, but I'm going to. Um, and I assume that I can just pop on Amazon uh, to to do that. Is that correct? Yeah, pretty much anywhere books are sold, you can you can find it. Yeah. Well, this was uh, very helpful, very insightful. It's always great to see you and 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 talk with you again. And I uh, I'm sure that our listeners will, uh, uh, many of them will pick up this this book. It's going to be very helpful. It's great for self leadership. Sitting down, you know, contemplating what others have said. These other executives, uh, uh, contemplating that within our own context. And I assume on the self leadership. Just one other parting thought on the self-leadership topic since it kind of became the the big one. And yes, the point is taken. If an executive is saying, yeah, I can see 50% of my time being invested that. It, it, yeah. For me, that's at least point taken for yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, and, and I kind of alluded to that earlier, didn't I, where I said, well, how much time does it take to spend on yourself? How, how far does that go? Mm-hmm. You know, in the sense of when it's spent, because it is a commodity of some sort. Um, yeah. It's not all a commodity, but it, some of it is right. And, um, uh, so, so anyway, my question is, uh, do you, do you address that in the book? Do you give some strategies for self-leadership in the book? Yeah, a- absolutely. And, uh, you know, just to kind of give a little bit of a big picture of how yeah. the book's organized, I mentioned those two chapters up front where I, I define organizational leadership as, as faithful and effective organizational stewards, motivated by an abiding purpose, uh, strategically align and deploy human and organizational resources in fulfillment of the organization's mission in a manner that's consistent with 
uh, both the beliefs and values of the organization. So I, I spend a lot of time unpacking, okay, what is it that organizational leaders do, kind of working through most of those words and phrases, giving a vision for flourishing. And then I go through kind of a, a levels of analysis. Uh, there's a part two is focused on the leader. And so issue, issues of character and commitment and all of those self-leadership conversations, we really focused our conversation on that. And that's really the focus of chapters three and four in the book. Chapters five and six, six turn the attention to the people we lead. How do we care for and cultivate team members? How do we have a context that nurtures collaboration and team alignment with organizational mission? And then the, the, the part four of the book moves into then what are some of the, the, the key leadership priorities that these surveyed leaders were talking about needing to get right if we're going to lead our organizations well. And so there's a chapter on uh, the importance of communication uh, in organizational leadership. There's a chapter on nurturing healthy organizational culture in the thriving organizational context. And then there's a chapter on uh, crisis leadership, which again was uh, really needed on the backside of sort of the pandemic reality. Uh, people went lots of different directions through the pandemic, but everybody dealt with crisis in different ways. And yeah. so learning uh, effective crisis leadership, there's a chapter devoted on that. And then the, the book ends with a, a chapter on change leadership. And in many ways, I think crisis and change leadership are sim similar, but one's a bit more reactive to the moment. One is more proactive and saying, where do we want to go and how do we plan our course uh, to move effectively towards that desired uh, picture of a preferred future? So the guiding coalition lives in both both scenarios. Absolutely. At some point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll never forget. I'll never forget that time. And I, I think the reason why a lot of your, your principles that you uncovered and shared with me way back was probably because they hit my context. Mm -hmm. So, you know, right, right on. Well, Dr. Irving, thank you so much for, for joining us. I already have an idea of what I want to talk to you about next. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll, I'll be in touch with that. Thank you and have a great day. Thanks so much, Jim. Glad to be here. If you're not part of the Lead Today community, let me invite you. Go to leadtodaycommunity.com. That's leadtodaycommunity.com and sign up for Monday Moments. It's a weekly email that will encourage your leadership. Again, thank you for joining us today. And thank you for telling a friend about the Today Counts show.